Hello and welcome back to my channel and welcome back to the Bible study with me series we've been doing through the book of Esther. This is probably one of my favorite Bible study series we've done so far. Give this video a thumbs up if you've been enjoying it as well and then comment down below with a gold star emoji if you've gone through all 10 of the chapters now. Today's video we're going to be in Esther chapter 10 so the final video the final chapter in this study and all throughout this study I've been saying that in this video the chapter 10 video that we're also in addition to going through chapter 10 that we're also going to go through a list of life lessons from the book of Esther and so as I was preparing that to film I realized that there was actually so many life lessons and just biblical principles of wisdom and ways that this book reveals to us God's character and it was like I said pretty lengthy but so good and so powerful and so I ended up deciding to actually make that into a separate video a standalone video where we can solely focus on covering those life lessons and and that video is going to be going live directly after this video so it's not going to be a long wait but that is coming and I promise it's going to be worth the wait because seriously even in just prepping it I was getting so pumped up because again this book just teaches us so so much and so that is to come but in today's video we are going to be covering Esther chapter 10 and finishing this story it is going to be probably on the shorter side just because this chapter is shorter but once again if you haven't already make sure you go back and watch all the other chapters before this one if you haven't already so Esther chapters 1 through 9 are already up on the channel but let's go ahead and get into Esther chapter 10 and we'll go ahead and do a refresher again on the context so the book of Esther like we've been talking about it is a historical narrative set in Susa which is the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire. And basically it tells the story of a Jewish community living in Susa, and these are among the Jews who did not return to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile. And this story tells us about a Jewish maiden who God uses to save her people. And all throughout this book, all throughout all 10 chapters, we see that God's name is not mentioned once in the book of Esther, but although his name is not in this book, his hand most certainly is. And all throughout this story, we've been seeing him just orchestrating things behind the scenes, setting things in place, and it's just been undeniable that it is God working through these seeming coincidences, these seemingly just happenstance circumstances, that God is the one who is sovereign over it all. And that is probably one of my favorite characteristics of God is just his sovereignty. And this book speaks to that so clearly. Another refresher on the theme statement of this book that we've discussed every week is that God's seeming absence does not mean he has abandoned his people. He uses the faithfulness of even morally compromised people living in a messy world to accomplish his purposes and fulfill his promises. This book asks us to trust God even when we can't see him working and to hold to the confident hope that no matter how bad things get, God is actively working to redeem his world. That theme statement is taken from the Bible Project overview on Esther. And as with every chapter in this series, all of the resources I use, whether sermons, commentaries, my Bible, highlighter, journaling notebook, whatever it may be, those are all linked down below in this video description if you want to check any of them out. But now let's do a little refresher on the story so far. And again, chapter 10 is really just wrapping everything up. And so let's remind ourselves of what God has been doing throughout this entire book. So first of all, we have King Ahasuerus, who is the king of this ancient Persian empire, and he asks Queen Vashti, his wife, to essentially parade her beauty in front of his drunken friends at the end of this lavish six-month party that he has thrown to display his greatness. But Vashti refuses, and so she's kicked out of the role of being queen, and the king then holds a beauty contest to select a new queen, and there we have Esther entering the scene. And so after this has happened, we have this man named Haman, who is one of the king's officials, and Haman is raised up to be second in command, and everyone is bowing down and paying homage to him, 
everyone except for Mordecai. Mordecai is Esther's cousin, also of Jewish descent, and Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman, and we talked about some of the ancestral things there that might have been playing into this, but Mordecai refuses to bow down, and so Haman is enraged, and he devises this plot to kill the Jews. This puts Esther in this position where she has to risk her life to go before the king uninvited to plead for the lives of her people, to plead for the Jews. And so it's this climactic moment where we don't know what's gonna happen, but she goes in because she decides that obedience to God and doing the right thing to save her people was more important and that she was willing to risk her life and said, if I perish, I perish. And so she goes in and the king basically grants her to come in and gives her that access. And instead of immediately revealing her ultimate request, which is to save her people, Esther instead requests a series of banquets with the king and Haman. And so the first banquet, she kind of puts off again, telling them what her ultimate request is. And Haman goes home from that first feast and walks by Mordecai and is reminded, man, here's this guy who will not bow down to me. And he's enraged and he hatches this plan to have Haman hanged because all the accolades, all the success, all the status meant nothing to him when there was still this one man who was unwilling to praise him. And we talked a lot about just that human nature, desire to be accepted and how it's never enough that ultimately that can only be found in Jesus. And so the night before the second feast, after the first feast, King Ahasuerus can't sleep. And in his insomnia, he asks one of his officials to read to him the Book of Remembrance, which details everything that has happened within his reign. And he's reminded of when Mordecai basically foiled a plot to save the king's life. He realizes that Mordecai was never honored for this. And so just at that moment, Haman is coming into the king's court to present his plan to have Mordecai hanged. And the king sees him and summons him and says, what should be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman assumes he must be talking about me. And so he pitches to the king this plan to have this elaborate parade, parading this person around the city. And the king says, that sounds great. Go do all of that for Mordecai. And so after the parade, Haman walks home with his head hung in shame. And as he's telling his wife and his friends, they warn him like, hey, it's not looking good for you if you're trying to come against Mordecai. And right in that moment, the king's eunuchs come to get Haman to bring him to the second feast that Queen Esther is preparing. And so finally now here at this second feast, Esther presents her ultimate request, and that is that her life and the lives of her people would be spared. And the king is like, who has dared to do this? Who has dared to come against you guys? And Esther points at Haman and says, this wicked Haman. And so Haman right then and there is taken away and hanged on, ironically, the very gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And so it looks like there's a victory, but all is not settled yet because this question remains of how will this edict that Haman implemented to destroy the Jews, how will this edict be reversed when by nature, every edict of the king is irreversible? And so that is the question that we seek to solve here in the final few chapters of the book. But basically Esther is given permission by the king to issue a counter edict that would allow the Jews to defend themselves against anyone who attacked them. Them. And so this basically ends up creating a fear amongst the Jews because here you have the enemies of the Jews who were so excited about this edict that they get to destroy the Jews. But now they know that the Jews have been allowed and permitted to defend themselves and to kill anyone who came against them. And so this ended up creating a fear of the Jews, which ultimately deterred attacks against them. And so on the very day that was supposed to be a day of defeat, the day when the Jews were going to be destroyed as determined by the dice that Haman rolled to cast lots and determine that day, that very day instead became a day of victory where the Jews had victory over their enemies. And to celebrate their deliverance, 
This day was made into the Feast of Purim, which would be celebrated for generations to come to remember what God had done. And so that is the story so far. And now we're going to go into chapter 10. It's only three verses long and it really just wraps up the story that we have been going through so far. And so chapter 10 only has one subheading and it is called the greatness of Mordecai. Again, it covers verses one through three. And so we're gonna read through those three verses and then we're gonna unpack them. And again, there's not a ton here, but there are some important nuggets that we wanna make sure not to miss. And so we'll go ahead and get to that. Before we do, if you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to my channel if you would like to see more Bible study with me series. And then again, give this video a thumbs up if you have been enjoying this series. And let's go ahead and do it. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Esther chapter 10. Verse one, King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea and all the acts of his power and might and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai to which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. Okay, so let's go ahead and unpack Esther chapter 10. There's a couple of things I want to point out. First of all, in verse two, we see it says that the full account of the high honor of Mordecai to which the king advanced him. And this just really reinforces what we talked about last week in Esther chapter nine, that not only did God save his people and deliver his people, but he also promoted Mordecai to a position of high influence and power where he could make a huge difference where God could use him even beyond saving the Jews. And I think it's cool to see specifically that it was the king who advanced him to this high position. And then it says in verse three that Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus. I think it's cool there that it doesn't just say Mordecai, but it says Mordecai the Jew, as in one of the people group who was set to be destroyed rather than being destroyed. He is now in this position of honor and again of high influence. And again, this drives home the point that God doesn't only save, even though that in and of itself would be so much immeasurably more than we could ever ask for, but he also restores to a place of honor from a place of shame and desolation. And so Mordecai the Jew is second in rank to King Ahasuerus. And I want to just point out here the mirroring effect that we see from the beginning of the book. In Esther chapter one, we talked about how this book has a chiastic structure. And that basically means you have something happening on the front end of the book that is mirrored in the end of the book. And then something that happens second in the beginning of the book that is mirrored over here. And then it just kind of creates creates this pinnacle effect that leads to this climactic moment. And I'm going to insert here a little picture from the Bible Project video that kind of demonstrates what I'm talking about so you can see. The book opened talking about the greatness of King Ahasuerus and how Haman was second in command. And now the book ends by talking about the greatness of Mordecai and how he himself is second in command. Again, literally the subheading for chapter 10 is the greatness of Mordecai. And so while we opened the book talking about the greatness of the king and this lavish party that he was throwing to display his greatness, we now see the greatness of Mordecai depicted. And it's not depicted through this lavish party that he is throwing himself, but through the way that he has cared for and sacrificed for the Jews, which is the next thing that I want to point out. In verse three, it says that Mordecai was great among the Jews and popular among the multitude of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. And here in my Bible, I just circled that word for, because it is telling us that he is a great leader 
because he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to them. And if we could just take a moment here to contrast the leadership of Haman with the leadership of Mordecai, I think there's a lesson we can learn. So Haman was a poor leader, clearly, because he saw people for how they could benefit him. He either saw people as people of status who he could align himself with to achieve status himself. I'm thinking about the king, I'm thinking about Esther and how he felt honored when she invited him to the banquets, which I think she strategically played into that part of his character in doing that. So he either saw people for how they could benefit him or he saw people as dispensable, a means to his own end goals. And in this, I'm thinking about the way he treated Mordecai, the way he treated the entire Jewish people that he wanted to have them destroyed. And so Haman was placed in this position of power and influence, but he wasn't a good leader because in his leadership, he saw people merely for how he could gain or how he could benefit from them. But on the other side of the spectrum, we have Mordecai, who was also placed in this position of power and influence, but he was a good leader because he cared for his people and he was willing to sacrifice for their good. And I think this again ultimately points us to Jesus because Jesus demonstrates leadership to us, not in this domineering, ruling way, but in that he gave himself up for us. He literally gave his life for us. And so I think this book shows us that the leader who is willing to give of himself and to sacrifice for the good of his people is the leader who reflects Jesus himself. I want to read a note on this from my study Bible on verse 3. It says that under Mordecai, as the king's chief officer, the Jews experienced exactly the opposite of what they had experienced under Haman. And this is referring to how the Jews had welfare and peace. There was a sense of peace and security that they experienced under the rule of Mordecai, where conversely, under the rule of Haman, they experienced confusion, lament as this edict was put out to destroy them, but now they experience security and peace. And so that is the main takeaways I wanted to point out from Esther chapter 10. Again, this is a really short chapter, but I think it speaks to us something so key about leadership, whether that is is in a secular realm or in a ministry realm, whether you are a CEO or a senior pastor, we are not meant to see leadership as this thing where we can just seek out this opportunity to dine in the king's chambers and to seek after these things that are going to bring our own glory, but rather we are meant to use our leadership position to humbly serve the people that God has given us to lead. And again, that can apply to not only these high positions of leadership, but we're Wherever God has placed you, whatever leadership capacity that he has given you, are we viewing that as a chance to seek status ourselves, to wield power over other people for our own benefit? Or are we viewing that as an opportunity to empty ourselves and give of ourselves for the good of other people? And this is something that I'm challenging myself with as I read. And so that is it for Esther chapter 10. And that is it for this Bible study with me series going through the book of Esther. We're not gonna do a time of deeper study in this chapter. We did it in a couple of the other chapters, but as always, I would encourage you to just pray through what you read in this chapter and process the things that you're learning and ask God how he would have you apply those things to your life. And as a reminder, we have a whole another video coming going through all of the different life lessons that we have learned through the book of Esther. And some of these things are things that we've covered just in the different chapter studies that we've done, but some of them are entirely new and they are so, so good. And just to note on that, when I say the term life lessons, the Bible does certainly give us biblical principles of wisdom for us to live by, but ultimately its purpose is to reveal to us who God is. And so I'm so excited in this life lessons video to ultimately dig into how this book 
points us to Jesus. And let me tell you, it does a whole lot of that, even with a book that doesn't mention God's name once. And so get excited for that. Comment down below if you're excited for that video that will be going up next week. But thank you so, so much for going through this Bible study series with me. If you have a friend who you think would enjoy going through it as well, please be sure to share it with them and give this video a thumbs up if you've enjoyed this series. Thank you so much for being here and I will see you in the life lessons of Esther video right here next week. Bye.